have some place to look that we can look unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. O Father in heaven, sanctify us in thy truth, because thy word is eternal truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Our message today is found in the gospel text of John, the 16th chapter, verses, uh, I'm going to select a, a little bit different scripture passages that were, that were in the reading here. I'm going to go back a little bit further uh, and touch on uh, some additional scriptures from verse 7. But, um, you know, we've already done our introduction thinking about, about focusing. You know, we could also continue to talk about lenses and optics and scopes. Uh, uh, but I guess the question, just to just to ask you and just for reflection, is what are you looking at? What are you looking at today? What are what is your focus? You know, it, we could say that forty days with the resurrected Lord. Talk about getting a perspective and focus. Now that's an internship. You know, we, we some of the dialogue that we read here was kind of interesting and, and, and a little bit surprising um, as, as we read through the, 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 the part of the gospel text that we read through. You know, look at, you know, as, as you, and again, as always, you know, grab that pew Bible and open it up. And uh, you, you see, you know, Jesus teaching them, and but you also have some of this dialogue that, that John included in here, which makes you kind of scratch your head, doesn't it? In verse 17, look at verse 17. Then some of the disciples said amongst themselves, what is this that he is saying to us? Why is that in the Bible? You know, do you ever think about why some of these things are, are included in Scripture? And, you know, that there, maybe we could have had in, in that in place of verse 17, we could have had some wonderful declaration, wonderful teaching, instruction in red letters instead of black letters. But instead, John puts in here, and the Holy Spirit uh, inspires John to, to, to include things like verse 17. They said among themselves, what does that mean say? Have you ever not understood something that Jesus has said to you? And maybe, you know, maybe you don't reflect it, and maybe maybe we just don't even say anything. It just kind of goes in one ear and out the other, and it's like, I didn't get that. Let's just keep going. No, but the disciples said, what, what, what is this he saying? And, and, and notice, Jesus takes the time to stop and explain it. Because it was important. And, and, and to make sure that they, they got it. Are, are you tuned in enough? Are you focused in enough? On the things that Jesus is saying to you? That, that you might stop and say, oh, I don't understand it. I don't get that. What, what are you talking about? <laughs> you ever said that to somebody? What are you talking about? I don't get it. And, and the Lord stops, and, and, and he explains it to them. In verse 19, similar thing. Now, Jesus knew that they desired to ask him, because they were, they, were, they were sitting there, it's like, wow, well, I want to ask the Lord a question, but, I, but I, 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 I'm not going to. But I, I have a question in my heart. And, and then Jesus initiates this. He says in verse 19, Are you inquiring among yourself what I said? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy in a moment, and so on. And so, all of this is 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 the disciples learning to take take their learning to get their focus right. And as I as I looked at many of these uh, these cares that were put on this cross. A lot of the anxieties that people have were, were a lot of the general anxieties about the future. A lot of you put to school. You know, obviously those of you who are students. Uh, what was going to happen? And, and uh, you know, and there was the serious ones, but, but still fairly general about, about health, concern for family members, concern for family members' health, and, and, and all of these things, which are, which are very, very real, very, very serious and very heavy weights and burdens. 
But what are we focusing upon right now? We learn from Scripture that Jesus, or that the disciples were focusing on all kinds of things, and, and even, even it said, you know, Jesus says, now I know that you believe. But we know that even as they were walking down the road in other parts of the Gospels, they, they, they tell on each other, whether it be Matthew, whether it be Mark, whether it be Luke, they say, well, they were arguing amongst themselves. My favorite part of Scripture, and we've laughed about this before, is where the disciples are walking down the road and Jesus is kind of walking separate. I can imagine that. That they're kind of in a group and they're talking amongst themselves and they're arguing. Jesus didn't say anything. You guys know what I'm talking about. This is, this, we've talked about this before. And it wasn't until later in the day, I don't know if it was over the fire or we're eating supper, and Jesus says to them, oh, by the way, what were you arguing about, or what were you talking about on the road? <laughs> he knew exactly what they were talking about, right? The reason they, 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 they probably all were looking down and wouldn't make eye contact, kind of an awkward silence, wouldn't, wouldn't say and wouldn't answer, and, it's, and the scriptures tell us that they were arguing about who was perceived to be the greatest. Now, this is a group of men that didn't have any focus in their life. They didn't even know what, what, what the big plan was. And I can't really blame them, can you? Because they didn't know. We're, we have the benefit of hindsight of 2,000 years of church history. We know what was going to happen. We know what's, what's unfolding. But they're sitting there arguing about who was perceived to be the greatest. See, they needed focus, and that's what this 40 days was for. So now all of a sudden, Jesus fast forward to the resurrection of the dead, and, and the Lord Jesus is, 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 is out of his tomb. He's in his glorified state, semi-glorified state, but he can't really be the way he is right now in heaven because that would kill him, literally. And, and uh, he's helping them focus. By the way, guys, Tension, tension up here, not, not me, not of course me, but, but this is the Lord getting the, attention, getting the attention of the disciples. By the way, guys, you're no longer fishermen. You're now fisher man, fishers of men. You are going to be running the show, because I'm not going to be here. And, and I'm also going to be sending you the Holy Spirit. What? What is the Holy Spirit? And he has to explain to them all about this. And so now, all of a sudden, these guys, the, the, the reality is sinking in about what their mission, what their goals are. And you know, sadly, the marching orders of the church have not really sunk in to many of us and to many people. What are the marching orders? Some of us are still arguing about who is perceived to be the greatest. Some of us are still arguing about all these little petty things. Some of us are still thinking that, that, that you know, we're worried about some trivialities. And, and this time after Easter, after the resurrection of, of the Lord out of the grave, that, that this 40-day this period, Jesus knew that he had to make good use of it. This 40 days now, no, the, the disciples are not walking around with, with the, I mean, they are walking around with the same Jesus, of course, but they're walking around in a sense with a completely different Jesus. You know what I mean? At least in their minds. Because now all of a sudden they realize what's taking place. Do you realize what's taking place? Do you grasp the marching orders? Are you focused on the kingdom that God has for you and me? Or are we still focused upon that catch of fish? Or are we focused upon fishing, fishing for men? And, and, and that's, that's what we have here in, in this passage. Well, you know, verses 8 through 11 of our text there, look at that as we see there. He's talking about specifically about the Holy Spirit. Let's look at the scope of Jesus' words here in John. Uh, 
He says, and when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment and of sin because they do not believe on me and of righteousness because I go to, the, go to my Father and you will see me no more. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. So that's the effect of the announcement upon the world. That's, that's, that's the impact of the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the world in general. You know, Leonard Ravenhill, the revivalist preacher that I referred to in, in just recently, um, he, he, he mentions, he says, the Holy Spirit could be taken out of the church and, and, and many church members wouldn't even notice Are we truly Pentecostal Christians? You know, I was reading about the growth of the Pentecostal movement. And, and, and I'm, I'm not endorsing the Pentecostal movement. I'm not slamming or, or whatever. I, I, I think that we can learn a lot from, from all of our Christian brothers. But this is definitely something to know. I think I wrote it down a few of these things here. Let me just see here. Fun fact, the Pentecostal branch of the church is the fastest growing by far segment of the church. Pentecost. In fact, without it, we would probably be outpaced by the Muslims. The Pentecostal element of the church worldwide, not just in the United States, but worldwide is, is, has by far outpaced that of any other branch of Protestantism and even Catholicism. And in fact, in South America, I was reading an article that I had stored on my, on, on my computer. In South America, they, they talk about how the Catholic Church even, which of course, you know, South America is predominantly Roman Catholic. And, and, and even they are impacted by, by the, the, the practices and the presence of, of all the Pentecostal believers in South America. Even in India, I remember back in 2000 when I was there for just, just three weeks, I, was, I, was, I remember running into some of the people questioning about, about some of the doctrinal differences between Lutherans and Pentecostals. And I thought to myself, oh, this, this conversation is taking place even here in India. I've answered these questions in the U.S. for years. Did you know? And, and I, I, think, I think the implication, and I can't verify, but you can research this yourself. Most of the church in China is probably of the Pentecostal flair. And I came across this, and I, this is the second time I've come across this, I, is that there are more Christians in China than there are communists. Think about that. There are more Christians in China than there are communists. Know, Died in the wool, out and out communists. Now, if that's true, and like I said, that's the second time I've heard that I, I was stumbled across it and was reminded of it. Now, if that's true, think about this. It's more, which is more costly to be in China? Is it more costly to be a communist or is it more costly to be a Christian? And, and being a communist was rewarded by the state. Being a Christian is penalized. And yet there are more Christians in China. Focus, people. We need to focus on what the Holy Spirit is doing. We need to be tuned in to what, what is really happening in the kingdom of God around the world, not just in our little circle. We need to lift up our eyes and see if Jesus says, in John chapter 4, it says, Lift up your eyes and look under the fields, for they are white on the harvest. And we need to be following after what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit. The notes that I have in this passage, you might be sitting there wondering, Well, well what about the Holy Spirit? We're, we're, we're a Lutheran church that says Lutheran on the door and so on, and, and we don't really hear a lot about the Holy Spirit within Lutheranism. What Pastor, explain it to me. Well, I can't right now. It's past time to be here, even. Uh, at least by the clock on the wall. But this is, a, this is really ground zero. 
for studying in the Holy Spirit. Chapter 14, 15, and 16. And you have two things. One of the things that Lutherans say about the Holy Spirit, and I read an article this week about, about Lutherans and the Holy Spirit, and, and this guy was a little bit satirical. He was from a, from a different, but actually he was a, from a Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod Wells, which is kind of surprising. I, I recognize his name, or his name sounded familiar, but I can't remember right now. But, but he talked about how Lutherans are, in a sense, afraid of the Holy Spirit, and they always double back on this statement that um, when, it, when, we, when it comes to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit glorifies Christ. And that's where they leave it. And I'm saying, I'm using, I'm talking about ourselves in the third person. They leave it. That's where we leave it. That's not necessarily here, but that's that's kind of the typical response. Well, I notice, notice just, just, just as we close here, I'm completely gone from my notes here, but um, look at Look at chapter 15, verse 26. But when, and I'm going to back up to, verse, to the beginning. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. Okay, so that's, that's 15, 26. Okay, now just drop your eyes down to 16, all the way down to verse 14. 16, 14, just, just a few, call, maybe column down in someplace else on that same page, probably. And then there it says, he will glorify me. So the previous verse, the end of 15, he will testify of me. 16, he will glorify me. And that's really all we hear within Lutheran. So what I... What I've got written on my Bible is the first thing is what the Holy Spirit says about Christ. And that's what, what I just read to you. That's what the Holy Spirit says about Christ. The second thing, number two, is what Christ says about the Holy Spirit. And, and, and this is what we probably need to expound upon a little bit better. I'll just put it that way. What Christ says about the Holy Spirit. Because our fathers are absolutely correct in the first part of what the Holy Spirit says about Christ. But here we have these chapters where Jesus is just explaining about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So how does this impact us? Well, first of all, we need to focus, people. I need to focus. Help me to focus. What are we focused upon? The apostles and the other followers had to shift their focus in a hurry. They had to shift. They had 40 days to shift their focus. Because when Pentecost came along, they had to hit the ground running. And they did. The Christians today need to focus. Overcoming the world, Jesus our Lord sends us help in the Holy Spirit. Hope teaches us to pray in verses 23 and 24. And at the end of the chapter, he gives us peace. And he says, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, O God, that you have overcome the world. We pray, O Lord, that you might continue to bless and strengthen us. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake.